Welcome back to Federal Energy Gaming Law. Uh, today we're going to talk about the Illegal Gambling Business Act. So we've talked about the Federal Wire Act, we've talked a lot about the basics. So before we forget those things, don't forget to, you know, remember those elements you look for in a gambling scheme and those variations on the elements, you know, consideration, chance, prize, the different forms of consideration, the different tests you use to distinguish skill from chance and knowing that you know where the chance for skill has to has to lay so and we've talked about the federal wire act anybody remember the essence of the act i know it's, we, we talked about that in some depth but it's a pretty hot mm. topic well in essence it prohibits the transmission and interstate or foreign commerce of bets or wagers. And the real question is whether it's all bets or wagers or whether it's just bets or wagers on sporting events or athletic performances, things like that. So we talked about the being in the business of betting or wagering. I kind of remember that. We talked about the pre-2011 DOJ opinion the Lombardo interpretation, the December 2019 DOJ opinion, or 18 opinion, and the limited exemptions. But the Federal Wire Act is not the only federal statute that directly applies to gambling. Again, in 1961, we had the, the Federal Wire Act enacted to go after organized crime. 10 years later, organized crime was still a significant issue in the United States. And calls were made by law enforcement to strengthen federal laws to address illegal gambling that crossed state lines or involved actors in multiple states so that the federal, federal government could get involved. Um, hard to give you a good feel for what it was like then. So let's show you a, a movie from 1971, an FBI training film. It'll kind of give you an idea of what the businesses were like back then and what the FBI thought it was up against. So hopefully you can hear this. Can you hear it? Whoops. All right, let's try this. So it sounded like a lot of people couldn't hear it. Can you hear it better now? This is a businessman. His business is organized crime. His products include gambling, narcotics, My suit. Price, loan sharking. Stolen goods, labor racketeering, and goons for hire. Illegal gambling brings in his biggest profits. Working capital to finance other criminal activities. Bribery and corruption of public officials, including some police officers, almost always accompany large-scale illegal gambling. The law enforcement officer must avoid any such involvement. Besides corrupting the community, he is sworn to protect Involvement puts him in personal jeopardy from local statutes and from the Organized Crime Control Act of 1970. This provides federal penalties for public officials who conspire to obstruct enforcement of local laws against gambling. Besides protection, organized crime provides layoff service for bookmakers and numbers operators, two of the largest illegal gambling activities. This call comes from the office of a numbers operation. The office manager may be called a controller, the office of drop, checkup, or counting house, the clerk's inside men, varying with the locality. Here, numbers bets are received and tallied, necessary records kept. Numbers operations take bets on number groups, usually three, in a given order. Digits are determined by drawing 
as in Policy and Bolita, or by daily published figures such as parimutuel payoffs, treasury balances, or stock exchange action. A lookout guards the outer door to the numbers office. But this and the other elaborate security precautions are no match for good police work. A stakeout team has had the building which houses the numbers office under visual observation. Binoculars pick up significant details of visitors and their cars. A telephoto camera records any suspicious activity to be later used as evidence. From this command post, the officer in charge maintains radio contact with other police units, prepared to coordinate the coming raid with citywide arrests of numbers salesmen. The numbers salesman is usually called a writer he may work a regular route or from a fixed place of business. Most of the bets are small, but the day's total will be surprisingly large. The marker lists the three digit number and the amount bet. Markers are prepared for secure delivery to the pickup man or runner. But number sellers need customers. They cannot long remain unknown to the police. Winning numbers are called hits. The writer pays off his few lucky winners. The payoff on a straight three number bet runs from 400 to 600 to one. Smaller odds are paid on cut numbers. Those heavily played because of superstition or other reasons. Correct odds should be 999 to one. This differential leaves a small percentage for the writer. Huge profits for the numbers operation. The temporarily happy winner is not the target. The stakeout waits for bigger gains. The runner works for the office or bank that owns the numbers operation. He controls as many writers as he can handle. He makes his pickup like an ordinary customer to avoid detection. This time it doesn't work. His departure is noted and the command post watching the numbers office is alerted for his arrival. The runner reaches the innocent seeming outer door of the numbers office. The lookout signal clears him through the secured door inside. Unit five, take the lookout as planned. It is the last free action the lookout will make for some time. The heavy door with its alarm system is open for the runner, bringing in the last of the day's bets. The cash has probably been routed separately to another location called the bank, headquarters, or clearinghouse. The clerks have run up the totals, and the controller is ready to make any necessary layoffs on heavily played numbers through an agency of organized crime. A parimutuel payoff at a distant track determines the final digit of the winning number. Unit three, look out, neutralize. Move on in. Judicial approval may authorize immediate entry without waiting for permission. Know what method of entry is authorized in your case. All surveillance units proceed with pre-planned arrests. When there is no longer danger of premature tip-off, 
the small fry of the numbers operation are arrested. With the subjects from the numbers office on their way, detectives are collecting, identifying, and preserving the evidence. Some of it partially burned, but salvageable by good laboratory work. The patrolman guarding the <coughs> rear exit during the raid brings in the important records that literally fell into his hands. Usable evidence results from good police work, planning the raid for maximum evidence and for swift entry to prevent its destruction. Effective, uncompromising law enforcement can make numbers operations increasingly hazardous and unprofitable. <sighs> Illegal dice or card games and gambling casinos are often linked with organized crime and the corruption which is its trademark. Gaming may be found in the plush legalized gambling casinos of Las Vegas. It may also be found in illegal floating dice games, often set up in hotel or motel rooms for their one night stands. The equipment can be transported in a suitcase. Every part of it, from the layout to the dice, is suspect. So are the operator and his assistant. Some players are regulars informed of the floating location. Many are transients looking for action and are easy to cheat safely. To find these marks, the operator uses steerers, taxi drivers, bartenders, bellmen. This driver is kept posted on the game location and will get a fee or percentage for the apparently half drunk, well heeled sucker he brings to the scene of the action. A Confederate keeps watch in a separate room, ready to signal an alarm. He may also double a strong arm man in case a loser starts trouble. It is to the lookout's room that the steerer has sent his passenger. To the cold and experienced eye of the lookout, this half-drunk sucker looks ripe for picking. He gives him the room number of the floating crap game and signals the operator to expect him. This time they have the wrong sucker, a suddenly sober undercover detective. His concealed mic gets word to the team waiting below. Unit five, this is T1. The lookout 514 has an alarm buzzer in the door frame. I'm proceeding to the game at 519. Monitor me and execute the plan when the gambling is established. Unit five to all units, proceed as planned. Statutes concerning players in an illegal game vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. There's no question anywhere about the arrest of the operator and his confederates. Besides police testimony, the case will depend upon the considerable amount of physical evidence and its nature. It will be carefully identified, marked, and preserved for the trial. Good police work by an undercover detective 
has put this illegal gambling operation out of business. Bookmaking is a most profitable enterprise for organized crime, which provides two essential services to the individual bookmaker, laying off his bets and furnishing the information he needs to calculate his odds. The largest amounts of money are bet on sports events, football, basketball, ice hockey, and baseball. Horse betting, once the bookmaker's standby, is next in volume. A successful bookmaking operation depends upon rapid relay of odds, line information, and results. Expert sports handicappers, often employed by organized crime, provide the analysis upon which odds are based. Team and player records and condition, location of the game, probable weather. The bookmaker uses long distance phone to get this information <coughs> fast and frequently. He also makes out of town calls to the bankers of organized crime to lay off his bets really and keep the book in balance. Like so that these incriminating toll calls are not charged to the apartment he rents for a few hours each day, he has attached to the telephone an electronic device, the blue box. Like all evasive devices, it violates telephone company regulations. The blue box circuitry permits the user to make toll free, unrecorded and untraceable <laughs> calls wherever direct distance dialing is available. Through the blue box phone, the bookmaker gets the latest point spreads on the college games he is booking. On football or basketball, the better usually wagers $11 on a pick em basis to win 10. Point spreads reflect the handicapper estimate of the competing teams. Baseball bets are usually placed at varying odds based upon the pitchers for the day, as well as the team record. To receive the incoming calls from bettors on which his livelihood depends, the bookmaker relies on several devices, which may keep his location or private phone secret. One is the backstrap. A simple circuit which connects the bookmaker's unauthorized extension to an authorized and listed telephone at a nearby but separate and clean location. Another way to prevent his incoming calls being traced or his location revealed is by installing a black box, a somewhat more complex electronic device. It absorbs the electrical impulses on incoming calls so that they do not record at the telephone company's central billing equipment. This bookmaker, however, uses the more sophisticated cheese box to conceal his location and private telephone number. He maintains a private phone elsewhere than the apartment from which he works with a number known only to him. He keeps an open line from his apartment to this phone at prearranged hours known to his customers. They have a different number to call connecting them with still another phone, which may be in an empty room or other clean location. This call is switched through the cheese box to the bookmaker's private phone, also in a clean location. Then during the hours that he monitors this phone from his apartment, he can converse with a customer who has called an entirely different number to reach him. Other elements in the elaborate screen of deception may be markers or records on instantly disposable water-soluble or flash paper. But even the tightest screen will not shield against vigorous and uncompromising police work. Informants are a prime source for discovery of illegal gambling. They may be on a police payroll, regular bettors, competitors, or disgruntled employees. This is a housewife who has discovered where most of her husband's paychecks are going, betting on sports. She gives the detective accommodation number that she knows her husband calls to make wagers. Even then, it is not easy to find the bookmaker's actual location. The telephone company will aid in tracing it through the maze of elect electronic evasion. Having located the apartment that the bookmaker works from a few hours each day, they keep it under surveillance. They learn the daily routine and plan for a legal yet fast entry when the action is heaviest.
evidence most plentiful. The bookmaker is off the cheese box open line. With all bets in for that day, he finds that to balance his book and ensure a profit, he must lay off some heavily played teams. It is time to call the bookmaker's bookmaker, almost always an agent of organized crime. Layoff is big business. Without it, few bookmakers could operate. His heavy work over, he waits expectantly for delivery of his daily sandwich. Information leads to investigation, investigation to surveillance, surveillance to apprehension. It pays off. Armed with a warrant, police plan their raid when the maximum evidence would be on hand and with minimum chance for its destruction. There is no cooperation from the bookmaker, but their continuing investigation will uncover other evidence, the unauthorized electronic equipment the testimony of the not-so-innocent owners of the apartment. They find the water-soluble paper on which the bets were written. And a little black notebook listing the bookmaker's layoff and line-odd sources. They lead directly to organized crime. Without organized crime to bank numbers, lay off bets, protect gaming, and bribe some officials and police officers, illegal gambling could be stopped. Two gentlemen from the FBI to see you, sir. You, the officer, must be aware of the connection between illegal gambling and organized crime. Only honest, aware, and informed law enforcement officers can bring the organized criminal before the bar of justice. Only incorruptible, impartial, and stern justice can make him pay for his crime. You must be informed on the major types of illegal gambling, their MOs, and the applicable gambling statutes in your jurisdiction. You must be trained in effective techniques to discover the illegal gambling operation through informants, observation, and investigation. To follow the operation as close to the top as possible. To plan the arrests so as to acquire and preserve the necessary evidence for conviction. So what you saw was a uh, FBI training film, and it really does kind of track the the illegal gambling business act pretty well. Um, so again, in response to the continued activities of organized crime, despite the, the the Federal Wire Act, the Congress passes the Organized Crime Act of 1970 that includes the Illegal Gambling Business Act. And so what does the Illegal Gambling Business Act Say, well, it says whoever conducts, finances, manages, supervises, directs, or owns all or part of an illegal gambling business shall be fined or imprisoned. Da, 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 da. So what is an illegal gambling business? An illegal gambling business is a business that violates the laws of a state or political subdivision in which it is conducted involves five or more people that conduct, finance, manage, supervise, direct, or own all or part of that business. It has been in, in, in substantially continuous operation for 30 days or has gross revenue of $2,000 or more in a single day. And you can kind of see that from the film, right? You know, they went uh, and they were, they were talking about, you know, violating state laws, 
local laws and the fact that they were paying off local police officers and politicians. So this is the federal government's way to step in when local officials don't. And again, gambling under the statute includes, but is not limited to pool selling, bookmaking, maintaining slot machines, roulette wheels, dice tables, conducting lotteries, policy, bolita, or numbers games for selling chances therein. So it's pretty wide. And state means basically any state, D.C., Puerto Rico, and any territory or possession of the United States. This includes tribal lands. Don't forget, we did that tribal introduction. Technically, tribes don't actually own that land. The United States does. The United States possesses it in trust for the tribes. So, so does it cover betters? What do you think? Oh, you saw the film. Was anybody placing wagers arrested? Or was it the cigarette clerk? The stick man for the dice game? <laughs> the runner who ran the, the, the numbers from the cigarette vendor's location to the clearinghouse, the lookout at, no, it doesn't cover betters. It covers all those other people. So, and that, and again, that video is pretty good at tracking this statute. So what does it mean to own? So if you own an illegal gambling business, what do you think that that would encompass? Financial stake, like uh, you're yeah. the financial backbone or at least part of the backbone? Yeah, I think so. What if it's a publicly traded company? Yeah, stock ownership. Yeah, I think so. You know, you got to... Offshore that's that's taking US bets illegally, you own stock in it. I think that's a risk. What about what do you, what do you think directing means? To direct. You know, I think mean, have some say in the direction that things are going. Have some control over how operations work. What about supervising? You saw some supervisors in the video. Guy that's running the room for the policy operation. You know, supervising the people working the adding machines. Back when adding machines were mechanical or electromechanical. What about manages? Oh. It's like any other business, right? You have managers, a little higher up than supervisors. What about financing? What do you think would qualify as financing? Funding the operation, maybe giving loans. And that was in the in the video. You know, the the obvious mobster in the black suit with the white tie, the white handkerchief and white carnation on his suit. Um, I, mean, I don't think you could get much more stereotypical than that. Uh, you know, in there it said that he would make loans to operators. Well, what about the term conducts? So remember the film, remember the lookout guy that let the guy that was carrying the cigarette package with the numbers in it 
uh, into the building. Is he probably not an owner, probably not a financier, probably not a manager, probably not a supervisor. And ducks means just about everything else. And we find that in the box opinion. Well, let's go to Merrill. Oh, let's go to box. So Box owns a billiard parlor. Uh, FBI agents visit the billiard parlor. Bookmaker one testifies he never laid off bets to Box. Bookmaker two says he occasionally does, but considers Box to be a better. Better three testifies that a hey, Box is also my customer. Box is a degenerate gambler. <laughs> Remember what a layoff bet is? We use that old example. You know, this is from a while ago, but again, we've gone over layoff betting. So customer A bets one side, uh, his book or bookmaker A's bet, customers bet a bunch on one side, but not on another. And he's out of balance. He doesn't have the money to cover the balance. So he can place a bet with another bookmaker. And you saw this in the in the video. You know, the, the guy with the white carnation in the black suit was taking layoff wagers. <laughs> so he's the, the, the bigger book that they call to balance their risk. And again, the government tries the same argument here that they tried in Barborian. Now, Barborian was a different statute. Right? That was the Federal Wire Act. And what does the federal government say? Well, Box took some layoffs. But Box, kind of like Barborian, was taking layoffs because he was getting better lines and, and or a reduction or elimination of the VIG, the service fee. Federal government said the same thing it did in, in Barborian. Well, if you're taking a layoff bet, layoff bets are, by definition, transactions between bookmakers. You are therefore a bookmaker. See the logic? Don't see the logic? Put you all to sleep. <laughs> It's Wednesday. <laughs> so essentially, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say yes. I think we see the logic in the video. I think you did us in. I think the video is pretty. Of course. The video is kind of cheesy, but it, it works. And the court does pretty much the same thing it does in Barborian. You know, Laying off risk for a bookmaker doesn't necessarily make you a bookmaker. Um, you know, he isn't doing this on a regular basis, and he's doing it to get a better line on a game, which is also helping his bookmaker balance. And therefore, um, he's not a bookmaker just because he takes better odds now and then to help his bookmaker get closer balance laying off that risk doesn't mean he's a bookmaker and in this case he's not he's just a degenerate gambler so and this law does not cover betters it only covers the supply side Now you can become more than a mere better under this act, but, um, and we'll talk about that in, uh, in, in a later case. This is a good one, Merrill. Anybody read Merrill? Remember the facts of Merrill? <clears throat> on the screen. Um,
So Merrill's a janitor at a gambling house in Detroit. How many of you are aspiring to be a janitor at some point in life? All right. Is this a go, if I do, I hope it's not in Detroit, anywhere but Detroit. <laughs> Great. We'll put you in Gary, Indiana. Uh, <laughs> there are a few places worse than Detroit. Not many, but a few. Um, yeah, it, this is not an aspirational job. Why do you take a job as a janitor? Why does anybody take a job as a janitor? You're a felon. Yeah, it could be that. And even if you're a felon, why do you take the job? For money. Money. You're taking a bottom end job because you need the money. So Merrill is a janitor and occasionally a waiter in a gambling house in Detroit. 1979-1980, FBI undertakes surveillance at the gambling house, you know, kind of like what you saw in the movie. House gets raided in April of 80. Um, everybody that's a better is let go. Everybody else is arrested. And Merrill is found guilty of violating the Illegal Gambling Business Act. It's so, you're Merrill's attorney, what do you say? What do you argue? Um, you know, Alex. I mean, you'd essentially argue that his, what he was doing wasn't essential to the functions of the, the gambling operation itself. Exactly. I mean, hey, come on, Judge, this, guy, this guy, guy's a janitor, right? He's, he's not... He's not John Dillinger. He's not, not, a, not, a, not public enemy number one. He's a guy that, you know, needed some, some extra cash to help his family. And, you know, he took a, a pretty unenviable job. And he shouldn't be prosecuted as a federal criminal for trying to earn a few extra bucks with some honest labor. And then he cites a Tenth Circuit opinion where a waitress whose sole function was to serve as drinks in a dance hall to patrons was deemed not to be conducting the business because her conduct wasn't strictly necessary to the gambling operations. And likewise, his participation wasn't necessary to the gambling operation, unlike, you know, people like dealers or runners or guards, you know, all those people you saw in the video, um, you know, they were all providing some function directly related to getting bets placed, getting bets communicated, getting bets recorded, getting bets resolved, funding the bets. But Merrill's not like that. Let's talk about the boss opinion a little bit, the one that he's trying to rely on. So boss is a guy that sublets the front part of the building um, for a restaurant from a guy named Davidson. Davidson retains the back room for dice games. So the owner has a dice game going on. Tenant has a restaurant going on in the same building, but it's the front of the building. Waitresses from the West restaurant would serve both the restaurant and the dice game participants. Uh, Davidson only hired one employee to run the dice games and two, you know, one stick man and two bouncers to guard the door. Um, Davidson and the two bouncers plead out, leaving boss to be tried alone. Boss appeals the conviction that there were less than five people Garvin argues that any of the three waitresses hired by boss can be used to reach the, the jurisdictional three. And what they argue is that the waitresses didn't know. They served drinks, but they only brought them back to the, the guards. Um, and therefore, you only had really four people, not enough to get to the Illegal Gambling Business Act number of five. And the court agreed. They said, yeah, you can't, can't get there using the waitresses. Now, again, kind of a unique 
circumstance with the waitresses because they apparently they never actually entered the dice room. They gave the drinks to the the the, the door guards, the doormen. And so while they heard rumors of what was going on back there, they had no idea what was going on. And, you know, they were just waitresses for a restaurant primarily. Now, the Merrill Court doesn't think much of that. Um, you know, that strict necessity test was only adopted in the boss opinion. It's never been followed since. And the prevailing rule is that conducts under the statute means performing any act, duty, or function that is necessary or helpful in operating the enterprise. So the question becomes that is Merrill providing anything necessary? Probably not. But is he providing anything helpful? What do you think? It's nice to have clean bathrooms. So does that mean that does that mean that, uh, you know, the landlord, what's the intent requirement with this statute or the knowledge, is there a knowledge requirement? Um, I think it's implied. Okay. You have to kind of know. And that's, if you remember the video, you know, when they talked about the, the bookmaker that rents the apartment and the not so innocent landlord, if they could show that the landlord had any, any knowledge of illegal activity was going on in their apartment, then the landlord's going to be providing something helpful, which is a place a bit, place of operation. So there is a knowledge requirement, and that's kind of what you see underlying in that boss opinion, is that you know the waitresses. There was no proof that the waitresses actually knew what was going on back there. That you know they had no clue. So, or at least there was no evidence that they had a clue. Um, here, Meryl knows what's going on. Courtney. Yeah, just about the waitresses. I'm wondering if there's like also an implied like should have known standard in the statute. Like maybe they didn't actually know, but they should have known based on the activities or something like that. Yeah, and I'm not, you know, and again, that boss opinion is a little different because the waitresses really do work in a restaurant and that business is primarily a restaurant. And in another part of the building, you've got the, the owner that has something going on back there and they serve drinks to, the, to his employees outside and they bring them in. So maybe there's a should have known, but here, at least in that case, the federal government never showed that the, the waitresses knew or should have known what was going on there was illegal gambling. And, you know, several of the waitresses apparently testified. They said they knew something was going on, but they didn't know what. They heard lots of rumors from, you know, friendly poker games to dice games. You know, and if it's poker game, poker games among friends, it's one thing. Or, you know, just a bunch of guys sitting around watching TV, whatever. But they didn't really have an idea and they weren't allowed in there. So they couldn't see the operation. So Merrill's a little different. Merrill does know what's going on. And what the court says is, well, by serving coffee, appellant helped betters to continue wagering without interruption. Not sure that logic holds up, but anybody drink a lot of coffee? Anybody ever drink a lot of coffee? Um, by cleaning up and preparing the gambling area for future sessions, appellant helped to provide an attractive place for betters to congregate in order to wager. Wow. You think they would have bet if there was a little dust on the floor? I'm not shooting dice here. This table's got dust on it. This floor's got dust. No. Real gamblers would prefer the dirt. Exactly. I don't think anybody cared. You know, in light of the authorities from the 5th, 7th, and 8th circuits, we hold persons who regularly aid the gambling enterprise should be subject to prosecution under 1955, even though their conduct may not strictly be necessary. And really, so what they were saying is, you know, and there's another sentence in there that by stacking chairs and cleaning the floors, 
Uh, it's just, you know, in regard to boss, you know, since boss ruled to the contrary, this court just declines to follow it. So what do you think? Merrill, a federal deserving of having a, a federal criminal record? Alex. I mean, from my perspective, definitely not. I mean, I think the way that they're like, actually, I think when we were talking before about the, how the word like conducts operates within the statue is kind of, I guess, this this catch all. I didn't even anticipate it would be this broad in terms of its application you know, necessarily. So I definitely think it's a little excessive, in my opinion. I think especially if the whole purpose behind it is to get at the illegal gambling aspects like I don't know. This just feels like an extension, like one too far to me. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think I, I feel bad for boss or for uh, Merrill, right? I mean, this guy probably needed a few extra bucks each month to, to make ends meet. He took a job as a janitor, you know, in a gambling house. And I'm sure it's not the cleanest and nicest clientele all the time. Um, you know, I'm sure they're, you know, it was kind of a thankless job, <clears throat> but he's nonetheless, he's a federal criminal. Now, why does, why did the government set it up this way? The conduct standard to be so broad. What do you think? I mean, I'm sure it was to give a lot of discretion on their part. Um, and, you know, so they could have a lot of, I guess, latitude to, kind of prosecute and really get at the issues as needed um, to address the illegal gambling businesses. I think that's part of it. Courtney, you had your hand up for a moment there? Yeah, I was just going to add kind of what Alex was saying. Um, and it, they talked about it in the video, like going after like low level associates of these industries and like maybe like threatening them, trying to get information out of them and like offering low like plea deals and things like that in order for them to get information on the higher ups of the organization. That is exactly it. That is exactly it. If you get the people at the bottom, they're going to rat out the people above them. We're going to rat out the people above them and eventually you get to the top. You kind of saw that in that video. You know, they go after the guy watching the door on the street, right? <laughs> you know, what is the guy who lets people in know? Well, not a whole lot other than he knows who the courier is. Well, who does the courier know? Well, the courier knows the people on the inside that are taking the numbers, the manager, that he hands the stuff off to. Well, who does the manager know? Well, he knows, you know, the guy in the black suit with the white carnation and the white handkerchief and the white tie, you know. So you start at the bottom and you work your way up. And you hope you get information out of the people at the bottom who are really have little to lose and have a little to gain from the business. So where do you think that line should be drawn for an illegal gambling business? And I think the outcome of Merrill, I mean, I, I honestly, I mean, the guy, I feel bad for the guy because I don't think anybody takes one of those jobs thinking, woohoo. I've made it, you know, it's, man, I got to, you know, kid needs medicine. We're coming up short. I got to find another job, but I can't interfere with my primary job. What do you think? Alan. I would draw it way heavier on the supply side. It's just my personal opinion, but I, I don't know. I wouldn't even yeah. include low level employees that are involved in the gaming aspect of it. Just go after, if you're going to go after people, just go after the boss. Yeah. You know, there's, it's, that's, a, you know, it's tough. I mean, I understand what they were trying to do. They're trying to cast a large net so that the small fish start turning into big fish, but. You know, this guy's going to have a hard time finding employment going forward. He's a convicted felon, federal criminal. And he's not, you know, he's, he was a janitor. <laughs> Courtney, you had your hand up. 
I was just thinking maybe you could get like similar results. Like I understand that the police want information and need information, but um, a felony is pretty severe. So I was just thinking maybe like for the lower level um, people, like a lesser punishment might, because, you know, you could still say that they are like assisting in this operation, but mm -hmm. um, a felony is just really severe to me. Yeah, I agree. I think it's pretty, pretty harsh. Um, so what do you think about these things? Uh, I know at the beginning of the semester, somebody said they wanted more examples. What about providing things like credit card services to an illegal gambling business? It's a much stronger argument to give that person a felony than to give the janitor a felony, I think. I agree with you. I think it's more risky than providing janitorial services. What about providing funds transfer services? You know, you set up a company to mask the credit card transactions. You're not the credit card service provider, but you're helping to get those funds transferred. Is getting funds in and out of a gambling business helpful? Yeah, I think it's pretty helpful. I think it's probably necessary. Um, what about providing advertisements for an online site that's not licensed in the United States, but takes bets from U.S. betters? An offshore book, bet.us. I mean, all this financial stuff, if you really want to shut down depending on how much these sites rely on ad revenue. If you really are interested in shutting down the site, then there's strong arguments to go after this financial stuff much more than there is to go after the uh, cocktail waitress. Yeah. Yeah. I think I mean, our, our, you know, is, is running ads for a uh, illegal offshore as helpful as a janitor in a gambling house in Detroit. Probably. You know, what about running ads for an online sports book that's, that's actually licensed in the U.S.? I think you're probably fine there because it's not illegal, not an illegal gambling business. But what if it's not licensed? Here, you got a license for Antigua or Costa Rica or Vanuatu. I think if it's not licensed, it's illegal, so it applies. Yeah, I think so too. And yet we see lots of these advertising advertisements everywhere. Uh, what about purchasing stock in an online sports book operating out of the UK, but taking bets from US betters? This is similar to maybe the second one. I mean, not factually similar, but kind of just on the issue, but I think it's maybe a little bit more attenuated. I don't know. I wouldn't go after those people. Um, well, you know, it's, it's interesting because even if it's not conducting, is it owning all or part? Yeah, certainly. Yeah. There was an article, uh, a company called Party Gaming went public in 2005 and their market capitalization was second, I think, only to MGM in the gaming space. And their primary market was the United States, taking poker bets, running poker games. And there was an article in the Wall Street Journal, and I've since lost it, where a now defunct uh, major investment company was recommending that their investors invest in party gaming trading on the AIM stock exchange in London because their margins were very high, their overhead was low and the profits were really good. And the analyst said, we've analyzed all the risks and think this is a risk worth taking. And I thought, man, if I were a prosecutor, um, that's brilliant. That, that's an admission against interest. So you've weighed all the risks. Huh? <laughs> 
or about the risk of violating the Illegal Gambling Business Act. Um, you know, what about providing software for an online sports book? Assume online sports book taking bets across state lines. That's integral. I, I mean, that's like uh, yeah. a huge part of the operation. Yeah, I think so too. And by the way, I've gotten calls on that. Well, we're just providing the software. We're not running the site. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> running the software is pretty integral to the operation. Um, you know, is that, all right, it might not be financing. It might not be owning. It might not be directing, supervising, or managing. But is it necessary or helpful? I think it's probably necessary and it very well, maybe, you know, and it's certainly helpful. So I can't give you a clean letter on that. <laughs> I mean, that's similar to like, you know, we're just providing the craps tables and we're also just the employment agency that's providing the dealers for your giant underground. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And for some reason, when it moves to software and things like that, oh, well, we're not responsible for how it gets used. We're like a gun salesperson, you know, it gets used in a shooting, not my fault. Yeah, well, except for here, we're, you know, you don't have blanket liability like that. And uh, yeah, it, it will be your fault. <laughs> if, if federal prosecutors decide to go forward. Uh, what about accounting software? And we'll get a wonderful example of this when we do the wagering paraphernalia probably my favorite court opinion we have this semester. Yeah, you know, if it's accounting software that is designed for sports books and you're selling it to somebody in an area, you know, you're know, you selling it to somebody in California, problem. Down. It's odd that the language is necessary or helpful. You said that's the general rule. Like that's a big, that's a, a pretty wide gap between those two terms. Yeah, there is. Well, I mean, look at Merrill. It was what Merrill did necessary. I mean, really just stacking chairs and sweeping floors and occasionally serving coffee. Is that really necessary for the business? <clears throat> Probably not. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, if I don't know if you've ever known anybody or know of someone that knows of someone that's ever bet in an illegal gambling house or going to a you know, like a bar to place bets on sports. You know, I don't, I don't think anybody looks at whether there's a little dust on the floor or, oh my God, your picture frames have dust on them. <laughs> I can't gamble here. No, it, you know, what he did was maybe helpful. Uh, certainly wasn't essential or necessary. But this is where we are. This is what the Illinois Gambling Business Act says. This is how it's been interpreted. That conducts language has consistently been interpreted to meaning to, to, to going to uh, having a definition of providing anything necessary or helpful. I think it's really, really broad. Uh, by the way, I had a, a student oh, maybe 10 years ago, maybe a little longer, that was running a, a site where it was basically just banners for offshore gambling. <laughs> and he was like, well, so what you're saying is that what I'm doing it's probably illegal. I said, well, are you as helpful as the janitor that stacked chairs, swept floors, and occasionally served coffee to the businesses that you're getting a, a, a click-through fee from? Oops. Let's take a look at the MIG opinion. Uh, this is one that a lot of people miss. Um, it's an interesting one. And it's an interesting one because of who they rope in with the jurisdictional five. Uh, we're done with Mick, we'll, we'll stop because we're, we're a lot of new material. So here are the facts. 
guy named Robert Mick is convicted of violating the Federal Wire Act because he's a book and a bar owner in Ohio. Um, now, he sold the bar in 97 and lived solely off of bookmaking afterwards. He had a friend uh, install a number in Louisville, Kentucky to expand the business. Um, he ran the business with his girlfriend. His wife was in there somewhere as well. Um, and then he had a subscription to the Don Best Sports Information Service for live odds. Um, he also had an arrangement with a tavern and a tavern owner to distribute and collect parlay cards. And he had a, an arrangement with a car wash owner and better to do the same. Now, I don't know if any of you ever grew up. You're all pretty young. Um, when I was growing up, you could walk into a bar or a barber shop and there were always parlay cards. Anybody ever go to a barber shop? I don't know if it's the same with the, the women's um, hair salons, but usually you have to wait. And when you wait, there's a table full of magazines and stuff. The guys, you probably have seen that, right? No? Anybody's been to a barber shop? They cut their own hair? Um, they have them in salons for women too, like tables okay. with magazines. <laughs> yeah. So you walk into a barber shop, there's a table with all the magazines on it. And then there's usually a little thing with a bunch of parlay cards in it. And you can fill out your parlay card. Um, you put, uh, you know, you give the, the barber a few bucks, whatever you want to bet on it. Um, and he writes down how much you, you paid and what your parlay card number was. And you could do that in, in taverns as well when I was growing up. They were just kind of everywhere. And then somebody would come around and pick them up. Um, and that's kind of what was going on here. Now, Mick and Cheryl and Harriet and the car wash owner all get all, all get um, arrested. And Mick's primary defense is, hey, we got me. You got Cheryl, you got Harriet, you got the car wash guy. That's four of us. And what does the illegal gambling business act say you need? Five. <laughs> and, you know, since you're only convicting five of us, You've only arrested five of us. You'll bring five of us to trial, or four of us to trial. I'm sorry. You arrested four. Convict, you're trying to convict four. You've got four at trial. You don't, you know, you can't charge us under this federal statute. Now, clearly, they could charge you under the state laws, but not under the federal law. We're not federal criminals. Um, you've only got four. You need five, and you can't find five. So that's his defense. What's the court's analysis? Well, the court says we don't actually have to, you know, the government doesn't actually have to convict five. It just has to find five. And, you know, you could count the doorman in a gambling club. And not only could you do that, but you could count the information service provider, Don Best, as one of the jurisdictional five. And it points to the Heacock decision. Now, Heacock was similar. It's another bookmaker. He gets busted. They have four people that they can grab. And then there's J&J &J Sports, which is a line information service provider from Nevada that sells subscriptions. And Heacock said, yep, um, that line service provider is your fifth. That's someone that's providing something that's necessary or helpful. We can convict you. And this is significant because anybody know who owns Don Best now? 
least I think they still do. You know, let's look that up real quick. So I did hear some news that they were thinking of selling it. Anybody familiar with Don Best? I'm not, but can I ask a clarifying question? And I can also try to guess an answer on this, but. Um, sorry, can you hear me, for Professor? Yep, I can hear you. Can okay, you? okay. Yeah, so I just wanted to make sure. Um, so is this saying that um, because they're saying that Don Best Sports is one of the jurisdictional five that like companies rather than individual persons can be counted? Okay, just want yes. to clarify that. Absolutely. And I would guess William Hill owns Don Best, but I don't know. Oh, I'll show you. Although I heard recently they're either selling it or trying to sell it. So can everybody see that? Side games. <laughs> so now, Scientific Games did not own Don Best at the time the Mick Opinion came out. Um, I know who owned it at that point in time, and he's a pretty good guy. Uh, but uh, sometime after this, uh, Don Best um, was bought out by a Canadian company and moved up north. Austin, you have a question. Yeah, so the government just has to be able to point to a fifth person to satisfy the requirement, or they actually have to charge them as well? No, they just have to find five people that own, manage, finance, or conduct. They don't have to charge them all. They don't have to convict them all. Okay, thank you. Courtney. Oh, sorry, I just forgot to put my hand down. <laughs> okay, that's, that's all good. So we get the Mick opinion. Um, I think it's interesting, uh, particularly in this day and age, because um, we have a lot of operators that are, um, you know, in this business. So anyway, court says, yeah, even your line service provider could be the fifth. Therefore, the jurisdictional five is met. And you could be convicted under the Illegal Gambling Business Act. Now, usually in most states, gambling crimes are not felonies. Uh, unless they're really significant, they're usually misdemeanors or gross misdemeanors. Um, so you definitely don't want a federal conviction, right? It's the worst of all outcomes. So let's take another look at an example. So Marty and Pete are college roommates and decide to run an online poker site from their dorm room at UNLV. Uh, at first, it's just you know, for the folks on the floor or the folks in the dorm, you know, kind of a fun way of playing poker without actually having to leave your, your dorm room. Pete's best friends, John and Mike are CS majors, and they help by writing the poker software and the user interface. Marty's friend, Bill, is a finance major. He works at Valley Bank and he helps them get a merchant card account so they can start taking Visa and MasterCard. First semester, things are pretty good. They clear 50 grand. Enough for tuition, books, room, beer. Uh, just before spring break, they decided to throw a party, invite all their friends. The party's interrupted when campus security stops by with an FBI agent. Are they in trouble? Do they have live, uh, risk of liability under the Illegal Gambling Business Act? I think they definitely do. Um, how would you, how would you argue that they don't? I mean, could you apply box in some way or like? Uh... No, uh, the argument that they don't, or the argument that these guys made, and this didn't happen at UNLV, but it did happen somewhere else, was that hey, you know, this is just a friendly game among friends. 
and there's an exemption under the gambling statute for a friendly game among friends. And it didn't hold up because they were clearing money. And most friendly game among friends exemptions don't allow anybody to earn money. Let me uh, let me show you one of those. I'll show you the Nevada one just since we're in Nevada. Um, but this did not happen in Nevada. Let's see, can't play the game. Just give me a minute here and I'll have it up in the other window. All right, too many windows. Zoom it in so it's easier for you to see. All right, here we go. Share. Can you see 463.152? Is it showing up? Yes. All right. So gambling game does not include games played with cards in private homes or residence in which no person makes money from the game except as a player. So that was kind of the similar argument that they were trying to use. Hey, you know, it was just for us guys on the floor, and then we kind of opened it up for people on the other floors of the dorm. But it's just like playing cards in the common area. No, no big deal. And, uh, you know, then we kind of opened it up to a few more people uh, campus-wide, and then, you know, but we're all friends. And it didn't go well. <laughs> it's a problem. Um, now, in this instance, uh, when I got the call years ago uh, from their attorney, uh, they ended up taking a pretty light plea deal to shut things down um, and no conviction. Um, some probation on a lesser charge, uh, local charges only. But the problem wasn't for them; is it kind of grew, it, you know, grew from, you know, a couple guys on the same floor to, yeah, well, we can we can let the other floors in, and then, well, we can let the other dorms in, and then, well, you know, we've got friends off campus; they should be able to join us and play, you know, we'll just talk on discord. We'll have the poker software uh, for the visual, you know, it just kind of grew like that. Let's go one more. So Lester from Gaming Data Services has called to ask you to write a website terms and conditions for his company's new website. The new website offers annual subscriptions to data concerning real-time odds and sporting events, along with historical trends, analysis of the event. Uh, and he asks for terms to ensure that there's no problem in offering the information on the site. What do you think? Issue, no issue. For you it's close yeah <laughs> yeah it's that's tough I don't, I don't i don't know i'd have to think about this i get this kind of calls all the time i think you can listen uh lester's not and gds is not involved in gambling itself but i think you gotta let him know hey be careful don't sell the bookies I mean, today it's a little different. So you have a, you have legal gambling in twenty something states now on sports. Uh, people find sports line information to be really interesting. They use it for for analyzing uh, potential teams for fantasy things like that. Just make sure that you're you're making some effort not to sell the bookies, Alex. Yeah, I have a question about this. So I know we were kind of talking about earlier um, with like the word conduct, 
in the statue and like how that's construed so like this example made me think of how directly like involved do like different individuals or like entities have to be in order to potentially be like implicated under the statue because you know obviously they their goal with their business and the example you know we just talked about is to provide like this information but it's not necessarily solely to do so to like you know unlicensed you know illegal gambling operations yeah i mean and that's it that's 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 the key for this one is that it is legitimate information it's we'll get to uh commercial speech in the not too distant future and you kind of get the line there but here there's a legitimate use for this information um i think if this was 20 years ago much more different than it is today but right now not so bad um because this information is pretty much everywhere. You can get this on the USA Today, you can get it from ESPN, you can get it from Fox. So a little different today, but I think you can do it. You can take that work. Austin. Uh, I was just wondering if you could clarify, you said as long as he makes an effort not to sell to bookies, I mean, his, his business model is like, put, put your credit card information in and, and you can get these line odds. I mean, yeah. undoubtedly, some of those people would be bookies well, or somebody working for a bookie. That, I mean, it's kind of how J and J and Don Best get cited in court opinions. Government's not out looking for them, but they get a line on. And, and to be perfectly honest, most illegal bookies are kind of equal opportunity. I shouldn't say most. A large number of illegal bookies are kind of equal opportunity criminals. They do a little loan sharking. They might be able to find you some mood enhancers. Uh, they could probably get you a date for a price to get my drift. Um, and usually it's the, the you know, the, the fact that they're involved in human trafficking or in uh, drugs that'll get them busted. Then they'll find the betting sheets and along with the betting sheets, they'll find all the printouts for the lines and the line information service and law enforcement from time to time will cast a, a, a large net. So, you know, what, what can you do? You know, I think you can, there, there, are, there are measures you can take. I mean, one is the terms and conditions can say, say that. The other thing is you can have an affirmation from the user that they're not engaged in taking illegal wagers, period. Um, I don't think it's, it's likely to become an issue. I mean, we don't, there are a lot of these services now and there just seems to be no issue with law enforcement. There used to be a lot of issue with law enforcement, not anymore. So the information is so much, it's, it's pretty much everywhere. What, what about you as a lawyer though? Let's say you get a call from a illegal offshore, right? Terms and conditions for their website and their app, their gambling app. Can you do that? As a lawyer, sorry. Could you could you say the question one more time? Sure. New fact pattern. Uh, you know, uh, betfootball.us gives you a call, and they say, you know what, we really, you know, we've heard about you. Um, we know you took gambling law classes. We know you're up on tech. Uh, we'd like you to write our new site terms and conditions and our privacy policy. And we're willing to pay your rate plus. Lewis. I'd say that was like just as helpful as being a janitor. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, you can't take the work. The answer is no. Can't do it. Same company calls you, they're going to do a, uh, an initial float on a stock exchange overseas, and they need an opinion letter regarding whether what they're doing in the United States is legal or not. Can you take that work? And you know it's illegal, by the way.
I mean, I think you should be able to tell them that it's not illegal. It seems different than your first example. Yeah, I think you can write the letter and you can write the letter that says it's illegal. What you're doing in the United States is illegal. Don't do it. You shouldn't be doing it. To manage your risk, you should stop taking U.S. wagers. That's fine. But you can't cross the line into actually helping them perpetuate criminal activity. So like doing the website terms, privacy policy, that kind of stuff, that you can't do. See the difference there? Austin. Yeah, so so in your example where you're, you're running a website that gives odds, you're saying to, to protect yourself from potentially selling to bookies, I mean, you probably can't prevent that objectively, right. but you can put it in your terms and conditions. But you're also saying you should write your terms and conditions yourself because you can't get a lawyer to do no, it? You, you can. You can get a lawyer to do it. Um, but if I were doing it, I would say you got to have the terms and conditions that they're making a representation that they're not taking illegal wagers. And I would put a pop-up in there letting them know. Um, the other thing you want to put in that pop-up is that uh, in the event of, of, of a law enforcement inquiry, you're going to cooperate completely with law enforcement. So it's up front. Okay. So could you just explain the difference between that and then Lewis's example of when, when you can't write the terms and conditions? Yeah. So one is actually taking bets from the U.S. Um, if you know they're taking bets from the U.S., you just can't. You can't do anything that's going to help them perpetuate that activity. But with the line information, one, they're not actually taking bets. Okay. okay. Um, you know, they're selling information. That information is not prohibited everywhere in the U.S. Uh, you know, there's a commercial speech right. And we'll talk about that in another class where commercial speech rights are with regard to gambling. Um, and on top of that, I think you're taking some kind of reasonable measures to uh, to prevent or discourage the information from being used illegally, I think you're in pretty good shape. You know, and, and I can tell you that the the pop up about we will inf we will cooperate with law enforcement um, in the past has been pretty pretty effective because um, you'll get people that will stop right away, say forget it, I don't want to do this. I don't want your service if you're going to cooperate with law enforcement. Now, the truth is everybody that is selling line information will cooperate with law enforcement. <laughs> Nobody's going to say, oh, that's that's private. You, you'll have to arrest me and I'm not talking. Uh, no, no, they'll turn over the records immediately. But if you tell them that up front and they're an illegal operator, they're just, it, it brings it to the forefront and they usually go somewhere else. So I think you're in pretty good shape. I think it's a pretty reasonable method for uh, making sure that you're not. And by the way, j, j Sports and Don Best were never convicted of any of this stuff. They were just cited as one of the jurisdictional five that could be.